Now, last week, we, we've been, we're, we're finished after tonight. We're done with marital intimacy, okay? So some of you can just breathe. Again, you've been stressing out every time you got to show up here. You never know what this guy is going to say up front. Uh, I will tell you, we're going to talk about sex one more time. You'll be all right. Um, it's, I promise it's not any more awkward for any of you than it is for me. Um, let's do this. So if you grew up in the church, you probably heard things like sex, we're not going to talk about it. It's disgusting. It's dirty. Don't, don't even mess with it. Save it for the one you love. Do you ever hear anything like that? Right? Kind of confusing. Um, if you grew up back in the day with culture, it was a little more loose, but you needed to be in a good relationship, be of good age, and maybe keep protection as a key, but culture had a little bit of a looser grip. Flash, fast forward to where we are now. The church is kind of really, uh, I can't speak for everyone, but we've kind of swung completely to the other side, where we know that sex sells, and so books are being written, uh, you know, sermons are being shared, uh, marketing, all that good stuff, but also we've, we've got this sense that sex is kind of the the apex, the, the highest point of a marriage relationship, and though it's super important, as we've learned over the last few weeks, it's a whole list of things that make marriage what it is. And so as I think about this, so, and then talk about culture today, right? Anybody want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, what is it? Two people's not enough. Uh, same sex is the way to go. Uh, do whatever you want. Have as much fun as you want. And then if you want to get married later on, you know, think about it, right? Maybe even not. It's just a total different swing that we've seen over the years. And so when I, when I think about that, I say that to you because I think it's really important that here we would find a appropriate place, but also a helpful place to land. Uh, because if not, we're, we're going to be confused and, and maybe even miss some things that are really important within our marriages. Uh, by the way, just for fun, I Googled, I didn't look at them, but I Googled uh, on Amazon, or no, on Google. I Googled how uh, sex books. That's what I Googled. I Googled just books on sex. Books on sex. That's how I should have said that. Sorry if I confused you. And uh, who wants to guess? Who wants to guess how many came up? How much? Okay, give me a number. 2,000 books. 6,500. Who said a million? One million. Anybody else? 9.8 million books. That's what I, I, I said, there's, there's no way. Like, there has to be, something's wrong with what I, 9.8, now sure, there probably were some, you know, duplicates or whatever. But here's the point. There's a lot of people writing about it. There's a lot of people talking about it, and yet there's still so much confusion. And that's what's crazy. Uh, and, and just to take it a step further, when we take sex out of its proper place, I'm kind of jumping in, sorry. When we take it out of its proper place, all we're left with, if you're not careful, is just technique. Because it's lost all the other elements that are connected to it, the spiritual and the emotional and all the things that make a marriage. When we take it out and make it stand alone, it becomes about something totally different. And guess what? It will never fully satisfy so we've got this challenge, and so our hope is that we could land in a place that's appropriate and helpful, and so the only way to do that, I think, is to just look at what God says, right? Trust the one book we know to be true. There's 9.8 other options, 9.8 million other options. Have fun figuring out, but I think we have the answer right here. So let me show you some of this. First, let me remind you what we talked about last week. Singles, we talked to you for just a minute, maybe longer than you wanted, but for just a minute, and I want to remind you this, okay? Sex is an incredible thing. It's a great thing. It's a gift from God. It's a wonderful thing, but it ain't for you. All right, so engage people, all of the above or all of the below, just make sure you remember that this is something that's waiting for you in its proper time. Song of Solomon says this, chapter eight, verse four, do not arouse or awaken love until the time is right. That's God's gift to you, but hang on to that. You can go back and listen to last week's message if you need more. We also talked about physical intimacy. It's not just sex. It's deeper than that, right? It's holding hands. It's hugging. It's a lot of other things. We spent some time on that. We talked about how husbands and wives weigh physical intimacy differently, right? They see it and they weigh it. They experience it differently. We need to understand that. We talked about that last week. And then finally, we talked about physical intimacy is not to be divorced from relationship. And we really kind of got started on that point and I had to wrap it up. So let me add one other thing. 
and it probably came up in your discussion. When we see movies and TVs and internet and pornography and fill in the blank of all the things that encompass ways for us to visually see things that really we shouldn't be seeing, what it's doing to us is it's taking the great gift of sex and it's isolating it and making it a standalone thing. Not only is it isolating and making it standalone, it's making it purely physical. And when it becomes purely physical, it misses its true purpose in its proper place. And so we had the question last week that I know some of you were hoping to dodge. The movies you watch, the TV shows that you watch, the things you look at on the internet, are they helping or are they hurting? Well, the truth is, there's really no way that you can see someone, I'm sorry to be honest, someone else naked and that be beneficial for you. It's just not how God designed it. God designed it that it'd be your wife or your husband and you, and that's it. And it would be the greatest thing ever because it's the only thing you have. And so we have to be, in our culture, it's hard. I mean, you can't even turn on commercials these days without seeing things that are just so confusing. And so it just the struggle is very real, but you and I have got to go to war to protect that. It is truly that important. Uh, something that was said, I thought this was very interesting, in regards to the sexual revolution, which happened years ago, this, this man said this, when society decides to experiment sexually, it's women and children who bear the brunt of it. That's good. That's good. Men, we're the protectors. Okay, let's jump in really quick. I have a few things I want to share. Here's point number one. Sex is for Oneness. Remember, all of this is biblical. Sex is for oneness. Genesis 2.24, this verse we've come back to time and time again. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And all the men said? Very good. All right. Try that again later. Okay, now let, let me point out a few things about this, okay? I don't want to get too deep in a biblical study here, but I need to show you this. First, it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. Okay, so if you've been with us in the last semester, we talked about this, but for those of you here for the first time or knew this second session we're doing, listen, you need to understand that marriage is God's gift to you, and it's the transition of the covering. You, when you were growing up, your parents took care of you. Mom and dad were your covering. They protected you. They led you. They nurtured you. They loved on you. When you got married, you left from under their covering and went under the covering of your spouse. So gentlemen, you cover your wives, and wives, you help cover your husbands. So ladies, you bring the nurturing, loving element that mom brought to the table, and gentlemen, you bring the leadership and the protection that dad brought to the family. But there's a very clear separation that takes place. There, there's a change in your life. So it says you leave your father and your mother, and then it says what? A man shall leave his father and mother hold fast to his wife. Okay, now in this room, I hope we're not dealing with this, but we need to talk about this. This is not Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Eve. This is not a man and man or woman and woman. This is man with woman. This is biblically set, biblically sound by God's design. I don't think we need to go much further than that, but it's always worth mentioning. That isn't just some culture will try to tell us. That's some, some random thought that old people came up with years ago, and they're just trying to push that on us. No, no, no. This was written far before you and I ever walked the earth, far before the sexual revolution ever happened or anything else like that. This is God's plan, the ultimate plan, and the perfect plan. And people will say, well, you know, it's just become so normal. It's just everywhere. And, and it seems like just the right thing to do. If you do anything long enough, you can convince yourself it's the right thing to do. And as culture expands in this generation, we have to understand that this is a real struggle. It's going to be a real battle. And if you have kids right now, you know this. Uh, we talked about this at our table, I think, last week. What the kids are going through now in high school, we never dealt with. We never had to walk in the hall and see two guys kissing or two We just never had, like, you didn't make it if that happened. It was a bad day for you. Now that is the norm. In fact, you are looked at weird if you are not for that. But biblically speaking, God has set the standard for you and I. And then it says what? They join together and they become one flesh. There's the oneness. It's a joining of two souls following by a joining of two bodies, physical. Ladies, hear this carefully. You, designed by God, created by God, wired by God, you were created to be cherished as a soul before you were taken in as a body. It's a connecting piece here. And so for everyone that's isolated sex to just be something physical, they don't realize the damage that's taking place because in God's economy, it is far more than just 
physical. And so really what is it? It is for oneness in marriage. It is the bringing together of you and your spouse. Point number two, sex is for pleasure. Breathe. I'm not going to take it too far. Maybe. Song of Solomon. <laughs> then I said that and I was like, oh, there we go. So if you've never read Song of Solomon, try that tonight. Just give yourself a little time afterwards. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1. Sorry if you're new. I came to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gathered my myrrh with my spice. I don't like us in the lobby where people can look from all over. Um, my spice. I ate my honeycomb with my honey. I drank my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Now, for those of you freaking out because we just said drunk, let me bring all this together. First, you need to understand, this is a poem written by the hubby after their wedding night, just like all of you guys did, right? Right, you just didn't tell your wife. And so tonight you get to unveil that. Sorry if you didn't, good luck. All right, but this is a poem that he wrote. And what's he saying? He says, eat friends, drink, and be drunk with love. Now we know that getting drunk with alcohol doesn't line up with the Bible. That's not anything that we encourage around here. But what he's saying is you should enjoy, and does that sound like, by the way, a procreation verse? Like, yes, have children, raise them in the Lord. No, this is, this is purely about pleasure. And so for anyone that's wondering, like, is the Bible for us having pleasure or is it just so, like we can have kids and be done? Like, how does, no, no, the Bible is all for that. This whole book would unveil that for you. Read carefully uh, and strategically. But what I'd say to you is he's saying, listen, enjoy. Enjoy your love between your spouse so much that if you could get drunk from love, you would. That's what he's saying. Enjoy Enjoy your spouse, okay? I'll pause there, won't go any further. But let me say two warnings, okay? Because here's the thing. The longer we're married, the more this changes, okay? So here's the first thing. Here's the first little warning. Do not let the pleasure of oneness slip away, not over time nor over distance. Not over time nor over distance. So over time, the older we get, this tends to be something that slips away, okay? It doesn't stop, it just changes, okay? If we're just being honest and we'll stop there, it just changes, okay? But embrace that. This is a gift from God to be experienced all the way through until it can't be experienced anymore. So don't let time be a distraction. But number two, not over distance. Listen, this is big because in our culture today, a lot of people travel for work. A lot of people travel for it, and there's nothing, I'm not, not dogging that or saying that anyway, Sarah traveled for her job for a few years, okay? But listen, 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 listen. We've gotta be so careful, so careful. And remember that loneliness goes both ways, okay? We always think it's the one that left that's lonely, but the one that was left behind is also lonely. And so we have to be super careful. And so when, when you have this as, as your thing, when you have distance as an issue, when you're traveling or whatever kind of separation there may be for whatever reason, you have got to be strategic and you've got to talk because God has wired this to be something a part of your marriage. It's a great gift, but there's some challenges different people experience. This may be one for you. It's worth a conversation. Why? Well, here's the second reason. Because sex is for protection. Sex is for protection. Listen to this verse, 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that, listen, Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Did you catch that? What God is saying to you and I is that this is also part of the protection plan that you and I would stay pure with one another. Man, God is so smart. 9.8 million books, and they haven't figured this one out. This is genius. Thank you, Lord, right? You can all say thank you later. This is genius. Now, now notice the first part. Do not deprive one another. And earlier in those verses, it tells you, husbands, don't deprive your wife. Wife, don't deprive your husband. Your body is hers, and her body is yours. And some of you are like, yeah, authority. No, you're an idiot. Listen, that's not what I'm saying. Sorry, I shouldn't have said idiot. I apologize. Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm going to get in trouble later. But listen to me. Don't do that. That's not what that's about. It's not because you're the authority and you're in charge and she does whatever you say or he does whatever you say. No, no, no. What it's saying is because you are one, you are together. It is a mutual thing to enjoy and to benefit together. And so we're not to deprive each other. But listen carefully. Just because we're not to deprive each other doesn't mean we're supposed to force each other. Okay, there's a big difference here. God knows that over time this will be a challenge. Man, you start having kids, 
right? And then you get nervous, first of all, just to, you know, but you have kids and it becomes a challenge to spend this kind of time together. You got kids running around everywhere. God knows that. And the older you get, the more challenging it gets. God knows all of that. And so by, by sure grace, he's saying, listen, I'm pushing this on you. I'm pushing this on you because this is a part of marriage and I want you to full experience the fullness of it. But what I'm saying to you is, I don't want you to deprive each other but don't use this as a place to force each other either. We're supposed to have grace, patience, love each other through whatever challenges, whatever issues there may be. But this is God's gift for protection. Now, it also said in here quickly, it said, perhaps by agreement for a limited time, you might take a break. And I don't want to ever skip over things because I think it's important. Some of you may be wondering, well, what does all that mean? It could be its own message, but briefly, let me say this. That is rare, and it comes with very strategic guidelines. It's rare and very strategic islands to take a, a break from each other so that you could experience a time of prayer. Here's what it looks like. One, both spouses would be in total agreement, okay? This is not a way to be like, see, I told you the Bible says we don't have to do it. We're taking a break of prayer. You're out. I mean, it's not like that. No, no, it's a mutual agreement, okay? The second part is that it's for a limited time. It's rare and for a limited time. The third would be it is for a time of prayer and seeking the Lord. So some of you are going, what, what does that even mean? And I don't like that idea, first of all, but what does that even mean to take a break to pray? Well, think of it in two ways. Um, if you've ever studied or looked at a brief description of fasting, fasting is to take something away, all right, in essence, so that every time you yearn for what was taken away, you would seek the Lord in prayer. And so this could be a way, in a sense, a way of fasting, a way of taking away that from your relationship so that every time you yearn for it, you would yearn for the Lord and you would seek him. The other part might be, hey, maybe you had a great night plan for Valentine's next week, which is Thursday, gentlemen, trying to help you out. Valentine's next week, you got this romantic night plan, but then all of a sudden some tragedy hits your family. You find out someone in your family passed away. You find out some, some tragedy happened. All of a sudden the night just looks different. And so you're dedicating that night, you're setting that night away, you're putting away what was planned so that you could seek the Lord and walk with each other together. So that's the, the basic simple premise of that, but I never want to skip over it. Now, now the big part is this, so that Satan may not tempt you. Have you looked around in our culture to see how hard it is to stay pure? Have you noticed? I mean, some of us are a little hesitant to shake our heads, we're not quite sure what's going to happen, we're going to get called out. Listen, you can't drive down the highway these days, especially for guys, because guys are just visual. Ladies, don't hold it against them. It's just the way God wired them. Talk to him. Don't talk to us. They're just visual. And so you got all these things distracting you, but, but ladies, you have similar challenges as well. The separation, the loneliness, the, the lack of love that you're experiencing. We, we have these, these different issues. Sarah always jokes that um, romantic comedies are basically a female version of adult films. Because what you yearn is not necessarily the physical always at the highest point. It's the emotional. It's the connection. It's almost the same thing. So, so when we think about this, we realize, man, the best way I can protect my spouse and protect our marriage is that we would take care of each other. That there would never be a void. There would never be anything lacking. He has everything he needs in me. Now, is that going to be perfect? No, it's not. But God has set a clear standard that, hey, sex is also for protection. And finally, this is the no-brainer. It's easy. Sex is for procreation. Some of you figured that out, right? Some of you figured it out the hard way. Some of you, you're on kid seven. You might want to think about kind of where you go from there. Um, that's, my wife's the oldest of seven. Totally understand this. Uh, reality is, though, this is by God's design. Let me read one more verse. Just I want to back each one of these points up with you with verses, and then we'll be done. Genesis 128. And God blessed them, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over it, the fish in the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Listen, have you ever thought about this? God in the beginning was the only creator. And then he gave us that gift. That is amazing. And if you have kids, you know that. And if you don't have kids, get ready. It is wonderful. It has some challenges, but it is wonderful. And it is the gift that God's given you and I to be a part of the creative process that is unbelievable. And God says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. Does that mean you have to have seven kids? No, but if you're willing, you should so that we don't have to. Like, <laughs> figure out your place in the spectrum of life and go for it. But God would say to us, yes, it's a gift. Now, what do we know? Well, we know from our story tonight. For some, it's going to be hard. For some, that normal process isn't going to happen. And for some, it's going to be a, a time of adoption. For some, it may be a time of just, you just don't have kids. 
And I want to say to you that if that's where the Lord calls you, whatever that might look like, just remember that he's going to walk with you through that every step of the way. I'm not promising it's going to be easy. I'm not promising it's going to be simple. But that he will walk with you every step of the way. But for most people, it will be a time and a gift that he's given us to have children and to raise them in a way that honors him. Um, just two quick thoughts as we close. I tried to move quickly so that you could hear a lot and we could get out of this quickly for those of you that are uncomfortable. I know you're out there. First is this. Talk about issues. Talk about issues. If there is an issue in this area, whatever it is, talk about it. It may feel uncomfortable. I think it, we, at our table last week, I won't embarrass them, even though I just told them who it was. Um, at our table, we talk, we, I asked the question, do you guys talk about Sex, like, do you talk about, and the, the, it, kind of unanimous, not, not really, just the planning part of like, hey, we should schedule time, right? We're just being real here, relax, we're being real. But the truth is, if there's issues here, you gotta talk about it, or guess what's gonna happen? Resentment's gonna build up, and that resentment will boil into a real challenge. And so as an encouragement, as a loving encouragement, you may not think anything's wrong, but maybe there's something going on with your spouse. And so I want to encourage you to talk about it, particularly to talk about the issues that could be at hand. There are also, listen, again, just being real, because I love you guys, there could be actual physical challenges. And to you, I would say, man, if that's you, don't be embarrassed by this. Go see a doctor. Go talk to someone. Get some help. Because this is a gift that God has given to each of us. And man, we want to take it and we want to, we want to move forward with it. We want to enjoy it. We want to experience it. And sometimes God's going to need to do some healing and that's okay. And so for whatever reason, it's become so uncomfortable. I actually feel great. I'm just faking being uncomfortable. Some of y'all are uncomfortable for me. This stuff doesn't bother me at all. You know why? Because I know that God's given this a gift to all of us. And that's a wonderful, and I can't say that to a room of single people. Sorry, single people in the room. I can't say that then, but I can say it to you. You have a great gift. Go enjoy it. Go read Song of Solomon and have fun. And don't tell anyone I sent you to do that, okay? Like this is a wonderful thing that God has given us. So please don't feel embarrassed. Don't, don't hide something or don't work on or navigate or talk about something or seek help in an area because it's embarrassing, because it's a gift from God. Here's the last little thing, and this is where you always get in trouble. But I want to say it. You and I, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us in this room that profess, profess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means that God has entrusted to you the Spirit of God to live inside. And so when we talk about that, we think about a few things. Number one, we think about how we would always want to take care of the temple of God. We want to keep it pure. We want to keep it healthy. And when we keep it in a place where it can be productive. Our bodies are given to us by God to be used for his glory. The Bible's been pretty clear. Sex is a glorifying thing to him. So you ain't got to worry about that. Don't feel bad about that. But also he would say your body has been given to you to be used for the glory of God. And so what I'm saying to you is I want to encourage you to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. I'm not talking about diets and eating plans and all that kind of stuff. What I'm saying to you is we should always be able to look in the mirror, to look within ourselves, but also physically and say, you know what, is this the best version of me? If it's the best version of me, hey, I'm doing good. If not, hey, I'm going to think about what I can do to, to tweak some things up. Why? Here's another thing. Well, not only are we doing it so that the Lord can keep us healthy, help us live longer, he can use us for his service, but also what an honoring thing to do for our spouse. That we would want every day to honor our spouse and for them to look at us and, and be proud. We're not, no one's ever going to be the same. No one's ever going to look the same. And we're not trying to say any of that. But the best version of you, okay? And I know for Sarah, she deserves the best version of me. And I want to give that to her. I don't need to impress you fools. I don't care if you think I look good. I could care less. But if she thinks I look good, I'm happy. And I want to honor her by taking care of myself. We're never going to be perfect. Again, I'm not saying go get on some diet eating plan. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying just think about yourself. Think about being the best version of yourself. To honor the Lord first and foremost. But hey, to honor your spouse too. That's a pretty cool thing. So this was fun, right? Wow. I feel great. You may feel uncomfortable. <laughs> feel free to email me afterwards and I'll forward it on to Sarah. <laughs> just, just kidding. But listen, we love you. Man, we want to help you. 
and this is all over after tonight. So next week you can come, and I promise this, you are gonna laugh and we're gonna have fun because we're gonna look at something totally different and it's gonna be a blast and we're gonna celebrate Valentine's Day. But because we love you and because the Bible is so clear, it's important we talk about these things and I hope that this is helpful for you. So we'll spend a few minutes lightly talking about this topic at your table and then we'll wrap up. But let me pray for us.